everyone for joining today, making time and a beautiful day um, to connect and talk about um, issues that are important to us and, and our communities and um, and it's, you know, finding new new ways to connect and learn and spread information amongst ourselves. So thanks for making time for that today. Um, and uh, to Caitlin for organizing this and giving um, me the opportunity to talk about return the favor. Um, this is a program um, I'll get into talking about the details. It's about um, we're in our eighth year of it. And um, it's a really it's grown into a really incredible program. We're real proud of it. So I'm happy to talk about it today. Um, just to get started, um, I Caitlin mentioned I work at the Wetlands Institute. Um, and we are located down in uh, Cape May County, um, just outside of Stone Harbor in the middle of a marsh. Um, so just a quick introduction, if you're not familiar, we're, uh, we're a nonprofit organization. We focus on education, research, and conservation programs. Um, last year, we celebrated our 50th anniversary. So um, that was a big year um, with lots of great um, kind of retrospective looks at the work we've been doing since we were founded on um, the preservation and protection of wetlands and a lot of the animals that live within them and then really important um, programs to get people out, explore them, understand them, get to know them better. And so we can all kind of work together to protect them. So um, that's our mission. We really um, strive to promote appreciation, understanding and stewardship of the wetlands and coastal ecosystems. Through our programs, um, we do have um, exhibits, we have a small aquarium of local local animals, um, salt marsh, marsh trail, um, we do education programs, um, we have great programs for interns, students, volunteers to get involved and learn about uh, conservation work through research, hands-on learning, education programs, all of that. Um, like everyone else, it's a bit of a different year for us with um, our facilities being and grounds being closed at the moment. but. Um, we do have um, new ways of connecting and doing programs and and that will be expanding um, here as we get into the summer um, some. So definitely come down and, and visit us when you can um, and, um, and reach out if you have any questions. My work in the Department of the um, Research and Conservation, we focus, um, Caitlin mentioned, on lots of things. We study the wetland, um, we look at um, how they um, grow, thrive, and persist over time. Um, and we do restoration work to try to restore habitat, restore wetlands, and see how the coastal systems can can um, can can manage over changing times. Uh, we work with coastal birds, um, looking at nesting habitats both in the marshes and on the beaches. We have a long-term diamondback terrapin conservation program, multifaceted. We do all kinds of work with them from head starting. Um, young ones with teachers and classrooms to doing telemetry work, studying movements and behaviors and long term um, mark recapture program for population studies. So cool work with terrapins and and um, from the beginning, we've also worked with horseshoe crabs at the wetlands Institute. So doing surveys of spawning crabs and and working um, on the really important population on the Delaware Bay. So we're real closely situated to the Delaware Bay and horseshoe crabs also spawn in the marshes and on the beaches on the Atlantic side. So we have lots of opportunities to work with them. And um, so one of the programs again that um, we do is return the favor. So that's what I'll be talking about um, today. Just giving some information about that program, how it operates, how you can get involved and kind of what the results of that program are and what we're doing um, for the species. So um, this program is not just the Wetlands Institute's program. It's uh, a partnership of, of organizations um, that have kind of networked to get this program um, off the ground and working. So um, we started in 2013. We worked very closely with the state um, division of Fish and Wildlife and um, also WISERN um, and Conserve Wildlife, um, amongst other organizations um, to manage and really coordinate this program. So we are a multi-partner initiative um, and the goal of the program is to rescue stranded horseshoe crabs when they come up to spawn. Um, and we focus on the Delaware Bay beaches where the largest populations of horseshoe crabs um, are found. 
So May is a very important month on um, the Delaware Bay. It's really when we um, see the, the height of activity for horseshoe crab spawning. Um, the crabs will come up onto the beaches in and, and large number and um, at high tides, uh, they line uh, the beaches in thick uh, spawning clusters um, up and down the beaches. It's really a sight to see if you've never been out to see it. Um, and uh, Delaware Bay is kind of the hot spot on the Atlantic coast for horseshoe crabs. Um, and importantly, they're eggs. So um, horseshoe crabs are really interesting animals. A lot of people are intimidated by them, think that they are, um, they can hurt you or they're aggressive, um, but they, they really um, look a lot tougher than they are, although they, they have, um, they're adapted and have what it takes to survive. Um, they do have book gills. Um, and um, and if you turn them upside down, you'll see a lot of appendages. So many of those are just walking legs. And even though they have pinchers on them, they are not like a, a blue crab or something like that. They're not aggressive. They, um, they really are just used for moving um, and picking up um, items, but they're not, uh, they're not gonna pinch you like uh, and, and hurt. Um, they, uh, you can see the mouth there in the center of all of the legs. Um, and males have a special um, modified appendage that looks like a boxing glove is how that's often described. And that's like it's clasper so it can, it can attach to the female when they're up to spawn. Um, they do have this tail. It's not poisonous. It can't be used. Um, they don't come after you with it. It's used for leverage um, when they get um, flipped on the beaches and kind of like a rudder in the water. So um, horseshoe crabs, there's a sexual dimorphism in size. Females are much larger than males, up to um, a third larger. Um, and here you can see where there's a male cra uh, crab that's clasped onto the female crab up for spawning, and that's often how they're found on the beaches. Um, and these two crabs also have um, tags attached to them. So this is a special um, item. It's like a, a beach tag that we have on our New Jersey beaches to go. Um, and each one of the tags will have a unique number on them. Um, and as part of a population study, the tags also come equipped with the information on how to report those numbers. So if you ever find a tag, it's a real special day. You can write down the number and the location where you are and the date and then send in a report for that information. And um, you'll definitely um, contribute to understanding how long these crabs are surviving, where they go and how they move on the beaches. And, um, and you also make someone stay on the other end, on the receiving end of that, they'll be really pleased for that information because the more recitings, um, the, better, the better the studies can be to, to understand these crabs. So female horseshoe crabs lay about 80,000 eggs per year. And um, on the right-hand side, on the lower um, picture, you can see the little eggs. So each of these little Green eggs is, um, is, a, is an individual egg and they often form these clumps. They kind of stick together, bind together. So you may find them in these um, clusters. Um, the females will lay those um, just, a, she kind of makes a little pit in the sand um, and lays those eggs. Um, they're externally fertilized and, um, and they get covered with sand and water. Um, it depends on the conditions, the, the temperatures, um, when the eggs are laid, but it takes a give or take about a month for those to hatch. Um, and it's estimated that about three eggs out of every 100,000 will survive um, the summer. So really um, it is this um, model of a, a plenty, a plentiful supply of eggs and only a small number actually survive. Um, in order to grow, once the horseshoe crabs um, are hatched, um, they have to molt in order to grow, um, much like other crabs and they'll molt 16, 17 times or so to reach their full, full reproductive um, adult size. So that is a very slow process as well. So not only a lot of molting, but many, many years um, before horseshoe crabs survive, um, will mature into adulthood. Um, horseshoe crabs are also, um, in addition to being parts of the um, uh, ecosystem, they're really important. And you may have heard about how they're important component of our biomedical industry. So horseshoe crabs, um, their blood is collected um, and um, used for um, medical purposes. Um, that is, the blood contains a um, limulus amoebocyte lysate. It's a component of the blood that 
can detect endotoxins or contaminants in medical equipment. So it's an FDA approved test um, that or um, component in order to test for endotoxins. So if you get vaccines or anything that gets injected into your body, it's been tested with horseshoe crab blood. So horseshoe crabs in this way are a really important part of human health and our, our healthcare industry and making sure that people, people are safe. Um, so there's a whole biomedical industry that's developed around horseshoe crabs. Um, the crabs are collected, the blood is, um, a portion of their blood is, is then collected and then the horseshoe crabs are released back alive. Um, so that's, that's how the process works. This is an older picture of how the blood was collected. It's changed over time. Um, but something um, I put in that's of recent interest, this is just in the New York Times last week, um, calling attention to the vital role horseshoe crabs play in this, bio, this biomedical role and how um, right now as um, vaccines are being tested and developed for coronavirus, um, horseshoe crabs are really at the crux of that. Um, so making sure that there's a supply of horseshoe crabs the blood and this life state um, that'll be available for the biomedical um, community in order to test and develop um, this vaccine. So really kind of speaking to some of the current events that we're, we're all dealing with and thinking about. Um, and the, um, there are synthetics that are being developed to kind of take the place of this horseshoe crab blood. Um, there's been a slow process for getting those also to be FDA approved and for the biomedical industry to start using those. So Eli Lilly is one of the companies that has begun to use a synthetic. Um, so the horseshoe crab blood um, isn't the only um, kind of source of that test. Um, and it's not exclusively used um, by any means. Um, and there's a high demand for, for the blood, especially right now. So, as the horseshoe crabs are coming up to spawn in May, um, it's also an important time for shorebirds and the, um, the, our, the we have certain shorebirds that are traveling a very long distance um, to travel up to the Arctic to breed. And in the course of doing that, they stop over on the Delaware Bay in order to get a supply of horseshoe crab eggs. Um, many of these species are coming from South America often from Argentina, Brazil, um, all across um, South America, and they'll stop over in the Delaware Bay, um, traveling up to 18,000 miles um, per year during their migration to get from where they winter to where they go to nest. So it's an incredible, and it's an incredible event in and of itself. And then um, the coupling of this migration along with the horseshoe crab spawning and the peak spawning is really, um, it's a sight to behold. Um, and um, we're really lucky um, that it's, it's right here. People travel every year. We get people contacting us who are traveling from all over the world to come just to see the horseshoe crab spawning and the shorebird migration. Um, so these, these birds will come in and stop and feed on the horseshoe crab eggs. So um, shorebirds are just small, um, small to medium sized birds. Um, they live in aquatic environments, so it's not always on the um, tidal, uh, the coastal tides. They could be um, in other wetland um, or aquatic environments. Um, they're, they feed on insects, mollusks, and vertebrates, things that are living within that sand. And they're all, they all have different um, modifications in their bill size, their leg size, um, that give them just a little, a slightly different advantage for different food. So they have these niches within the same environment where they can split up the food and um, and kind of go after different resources. And there are many different species that stop over on the on the Delaware Bay. So red knot is one that um, is kind of a been gotten a lot of attention. It's it's one of the primary species we hear about when we talk about the Delaware Bay and horseshoe crab eggs. Um, this uh, red knots, this subspecies, the Rufa red knot that migrates along the Atlantic flyway um, was listed as a threatened species just a couple years ago. So their numbers have been declining and um, also tracking some of the declines with the horseshoe crabs um, with that population. So um, they, their population size is small to begin with and then has been decreasing um, and they really make the most extensive migration among these um, Arctic breeding shorebirds. And um, 
uh, there's a lot of study going on, long-term monitoring programs going on to track the species, both here in the Delaware Bay, other areas where they stop over during migration, wintering grounds, as well as their Arctic breeding grounds. Uh, the red knots are joined on the beaches by other species. This is a ruddy turnstone um, with its black bib. Um, they also nest up in the Arctic, and they can be found both on the Delaware Bay, and we'll see them on um, maybe rocky jetties or along the um, Atlantic beaches and marshes. Uh, Semi-palmated sandpipers, um, their population size is much larger, but it is also um, tracking downwards, so their trends are not as great, uh, population trends aren't as great as well. Uh, Sanderline, um, this is a species that we see um, that also breeds in the Arctic, so all these birds are making these long distance um, migrations. Um, this is a species that you often see on the Atlantic beaches that follows the waves and kind of does like a sewing machine, uh, probing into the sand with its bill um, after food, and we see them um, on the beaches quite a bit. So as um, the crabs are coming up to spawn um, on the Delaware Bay, what we would see are the crabs up in small and large numbers as we hit into May, and then what's left behind if you um, all those female crabs are laying 70, 80,000 crab um, eggs over the course of the summer. And so you get this plentiful amount of eggs that eventually, um, it, when spawning numbers are high, um, will come to the surface of, um, of the beach. They get washed up by wave action or the action of other crabs during the spawning event. So um, crabs will, I'm sorry, the shorebirds have access to these eggs that are right at the surface. They can also probe for eggs that are just a little bit, um, you know, at different depths within the sand. Uh, but they'll come in, and these are eggs that um, once they hit the surface, they are not able to develop. Um, the eggs need to be buried underneath of the surface of the sand in order to, to properly develop. So once they get washed up um, by the ties or by other crabs, they're available for birds to eat. Um, and so they do. So it's a big feast um, of horseshoe crabs, of uh, horseshoe crab eggs for these birds um, to eat. And it's the act of having so many crabs up to spawn that provides the eggs and also makes those eggs available. So it's this very interesting coupling of systems between the shorebird migration and this horseshoe crab spawning event in prime time on the Delaware Bay um, that makes for just an incredible, incredible story and um, a lining of, um, of species. So over time, um, we have seen the horseshoe crab numbers drop, however, um, they're at lower numbers than they once were, um, largely, well, due to a lot of reasons, um, over harvesting is one, um, they're harvested for bait for eel and whelk primarily, um, degraded habitat, um, the conditions at the beaches just aren't what they, they used to be, and so lost or developed habitat um, is also um, impacting the population. Um, and so when the crab population is um, uh, declining and we have all these shorebird species that are dependent on these eggs or really it's a primary source of fuel for them as they're making their Arctic bound um, migration, then we have started to see declines in the shorebird populations as well. And um, so one of the um, places where return the favor steps in is to help with these crabs that are getting um, kind of this unnecessary loss of stranded crabs on the beaches when they come up to spawn. Um, it's a vulnerable time for them. They're fittest and, and most equipped for being in the water, um, but they do come up to spawn. And, and when they do, they're at risk to being left behind on the beaches um, and overturned by waves, by the wave action, especially on really rough nights. Um, the bay shore tends to be very calm. Um, and there's extensive tidal flats that really help to dissipate that wave energy. Um, but, but again, we've had degraded conditions in our, in our beaches and, um, and sometimes it's so stormy. And so the crabs are at risk of getting overturned and they're left upside down basically on the beaches. Um, if they're not able to use that tail or telson to turn themselves over, um, they are at risk of getting um, predated um, there are large gull species and, and other animals that'll come, um, 
skulls are the primary um, target here, and they'll come and they'll um, they'll eat the insides, the soft undersides of the crabs. Um, their armor is really that top carapace of the shell, um, and so if they're upside down, um, they are vulnerable to predation. Um, also, when they're upside down, those book gills are exposed um, and can dry out um, with wind and just exposure to the air, um, and and when they're and dry, and um, and then also the heat um, can can cause um, them to over to overheat and to die that way. So, over crabs on the beaches are um, at risk to to dying, and so we can um, help them out by just turning them over. And um, getting them on their legs so they can get back into the water and um, cool off, have their gills wet, be able to, you know, be able to um, to carry on and live another day. So that's what we try to do um, through this program. Another problem for the crabs on the beaches is the condition of the beaches um, where there's been development and they get trapped in our jetties or bulkheads. Um, or areas where the um, marshes have um, um, degraded, where the beaches have eroded into the marshes, and so um, crabs will get stuck in the vegetation of the marsh um, or the, the dune grasses or um, into overwash areas. And then they can get stranded with the if the high tide doesn't come up to reach them again, they can't get out of those areas um, without um, the help of water or the help of people. And so we can identify those areas, go into those areas with our volunteers and help free those crabs from these impingements or strandings. And this is, um, these are some images from the beaches that are very important spawning beaches for horseshoe crabs. And you can see it just, we don't have those beautiful um, sandy beaches. There's often a lot of debris material um, um, broken down bulkheads or where there were structures of homes um, or rubble left over from demolished homes. Um, that just stays on the beaches or becomes exposed and it's a risk for these crabs every time they come up to spawn. Um, here are some images of crabs that are left behind um, either being stranded upside down or in, in large numbers or push back into um, marshes, overwash areas by high tide storms, or when there is um, erosional beaches where we lose dunes and we have overwash areas um, that trap the crabs and they just can't get back into the water. Um, so these crabs would ultimately succumb to exposure. Um, and so we help crabs in these areas as well. And these are some that are trapped in some of those um, man-made um, impinged areas, rubble, docks, home structures, all of that. So this is up and down the coast of the Delaware Bay. Um, these are the problems that are additive. So um, contributing to the mortality of crabs um, that are, um, uh, that, that we can simply get out and help in a pretty easy way through this volunteer program. So the goal of the Return of the Favor program is to rescue those stranded crabs. It's pretty simple and straightforward. Um, we're organized, um, we provide a, a level of organization to this walks and to these programs. And um, I'll get into it in a minute, but um, it's really important that this is, and, and also necessary because many beaches on the Delaware Bay are, are closed during the month of May because of that um, shorebird migration. And so there needs to be structure and organization in order to allow people to access the beaches to help these crabs. Um, through this program, we also strive to increase the awareness of horseshoe crabs, so get more people more knowledgeable, involved about um, the crabs themselves, um, shorebird conservation, their management issues, and, and larger um, conservation incentives and ways that they can, they can contribute. Um, and we also have our volunteers collect data, so we don't just go um, turn crabs or rescue them. We also collect data about where they are, the numbers, whether they're male or female, and what potential hazards are. So we can contribute to restoration projects, we can contribute to the tagging programs, population studies, and other things. And so um, we really have um, become a, eyes and ears and, and a way to kind of link multiple programs um, for horseshoe crabs. So there are some unique factors in the state of New Jersey um, that were the whole reason that this program was developed. Um, 
there's a horseshoe crab moratorium um, in in New Jersey. So it's the only state that has a complete moratorium against any harvest of male or female um, horseshoe crabs. Um, so that's one thing. Um, also, as I mentioned, the beaches are closed for sh shorebirds. So when the shorebirds are migrating through and stopping over to eat, um, they they arrive on the Delaware Bay famished. They are they are hungry. They have used all their reserves in those and those legs of their migration to reach this point. And it's very, it's vitally important that they get the fuel that they need in order to reach the final leg up to the Arctic. And the better condition they can leave the Delaware Bay, it's linked to better um, reproductive success once they get to in survival to even make it to the Arctic, and then to have a successful breeding season once they are there. So what happens in the Delaware Bay is really important for these uh, shorebirds for their migration and for their population recoveries as well. So the beaches are closed from May 7th to June 7th, a select number of them. And those tend to be the beaches that are the most important for spawning horseshoe crabs. So where there's spawning horseshoe crabs, there's eggs and where there's eggs, there's shorebirds. And so those are the beaches that are closed. Um, so people can't go on those beaches to rescue horseshoe crabs. Um, that's another reason that this program was organized so we could provide the structure and um, the necessary permits and everything to um, allow volunteers to be able to go do that. So we have to make sure that everyone involved in this program has the permission that's needed. Um, we have to do that every year. Um, we get permission to go onto these access, uh, access these closed beaches um, at certain times of the day. And we have to make sure that everyone is mining the wildlife regulations that protect shorebirds, that protect horseshoe crabs, and other wildlife um, on the bayshore. So this is a beach that is covered in horseshoe crab. I'm um, sorry, shorebirds um, eating horseshoe crab eggs, and this is exactly why the beaches are closed. If people were there recreating and and doing their thing, these birds would not be able to to just eat at will, which is what they need to do over a short period of time. So, um, so we can't go on to beaches during the daytime um, that are closed for the shorebirds. This um, map is going to show the extent of where our program works. So, to the north, we our our farthest beach to the north is Sea Breeze up in Cumberland County, um, and we cover many sites up and down uh, Cumberland County Beach all the way to Higby and Sunset Beach in Cape May County. So we have anywhere from 18 to 20 beaches that we cover any given summer. And, um, and we do this with the help of nine pro, uh, partners who help to organize volunteers, support volunteers, and um, really uh, do the trainings and get everyone the equipment and, and the support that they need in order to, to do this program. Um, the beaches with the, the red stars indicate beaches that are closed for uh, shorebirds. So from May 7th to June 7th, you can't go on those beaches at all um, unless you're working with the return the favor program and um, have the permission that you need and the permits to be able to access those beaches. Um, and that's only done at night. Um, and, and I'll talk about that a little bit more, but you can see it's quite extensive. The majority of beaches have some level of closing um, during the, the height of the shorebird migration. Um, here's a list of our beaches, and again, this kind of provides the same information just in a, in a table format. The names of the beaches, whether or not they're closed or have portions of them closed to access from May 7th to June 7th. And then the organization that helps us to manage and, and, and uh, kind of lead those beaches and, and help with volunteers. So we have a lot of folks who are involved in it, um, partners who've been committed to the program from the very beginning. Um, we also develop fact sheets for each beach. We do this every year. Um, it includes information that's helpful to our volunteers, how to, what the directions, how to get there, that's important. Um, information about whether it's closed or open, um, who's sponsoring that, which of our partner organizations sponsors it. Um, information about um, known hazards on the beach for horseshoe crabs or for our volunteers, um, how they, other activities that go on. So a lot of these beaches have shorebird, monitoring teams out there, maybe horseshoe crab, uh, tagging teams out there, spawning surveys. So lots of other things going on at the beaches. So we, we make sure all of our volunteers are aware of those 
And then different safety information. Um, we give the stats on the beach um, from previous year. And each of our beaches is divided into sections. So we know um, our volunteers know uh, which areas to cover for their walks. So when we do our walks, um, we, we focus from May to June, which are the, the target, um, the, the, the height of the spawning season. We will start the program usually in late April and it runs through July 15th. So while it's more expansive than May and June, May and June are, the, are really the tar target times, the most important times to be out. Um, on closed beaches, so those beaches that are closed for shorebirds from May to June 7th, um, all the walks have to be done after sunset and before sunrise. So it really um, speaks to the dedication of our volunteers. Many people are going out after, this, after the lights are out. Um, so, you know, that could be a um, 11 p.m. Uh, you know, start of a walk or some folks are getting up at 4 a.m. and going out before the sun rises to make sure the crabs are safe on the beaches. So people um, really go out of their way um, to be a part of this program and to help not only help the, the horseshoe crabs, but also help the shorebirds so they're not bothered during the day. Um, we target our walks for falling or low tides and really um, try to be strategic about getting people out around full and new moons when the most crabs are up to spawn. Um, and we kind of have, we have a structure for how we schedule and organize our, our walks. Um, we have a, a email in order to get in touch with us all the time for help with that. We consult with um, our volunteers about, um, about when best to schedule. We provide a, a table that has, um, and we use a, an app, a scheduling app in order to provide times, the best, the best times to get out. Um, and we also make sure people know um, there's only a lot of times after sunset on closed beaches um, and um, we provide walks that are in the, the right tidal phase as well. Um, we also require and are required to have all of the same beaches where the volunteers are going to be out, but they're located above the high tide line. Um, oyster catchers lay their eggs right in the sand. They dig a scrape and um, and so it doesn't have a whole lot of decoration, but they're vulnerable. They, the eggs blend in. And so someone who's walking and not looking could very easily step on those eggs. And even the chicks, the chicks blend in very well with the sand and um, the vegetative material on the beaches. And so um, we make sure all volunteers know to look for them and, um, and also to um, keep their eyes out for, for oyster catchers so we can report those back. Um, the other thing our, our volunteers look out for are uh, diamondback terrapins. They live on the bay and in the marshes, and um, they not only nest on the beaches, but they also wash up on the beaches sometimes when they've been drowned in um, um, crab pots or fishing gear. And so we can we get reports of those from our volunteers, and so we've started keeping track of that over time. And I think I'm going to take, before I get into a little bit more, I'm going to take the moment to uh, go over some questions. So, Caitlin, do you want to point me to the questions? Sure, Lisa. Um, awesome job so far. It's a lot of great info. Um, I do have, uh, the first question I have is a private, when I got privately, um, if you could explain what book gills are a little bit more on the horseshoe crab. Sure. So, um, uh, horseshoe crabs, it, they're described as book gills because the, um, the gills look like the pages of a book. Um, I wish I had some here so I could show you in front of me. Um, but they're, um, the folds of the gills um, are like pages of the book. So it really creates a whole lot of surface area in order for oxygen to be ex um, exchanged between the water and the, the animal, in this case, the horseshoe crab. And so um, they have a cover on them. So when the horseshoe crabs are up out of the water, um, there's a protective layer that helps to, that kind of covers. Um, it's like a flap, I guess you could describe it, that helps to um, prevent those um, gills from drying out when they're exposed to hot sand or the sun. Um, but, um, but despite that protective, um, feature, they still can dry out or desiccate if they're exposed for too long. So the book hills are really important that they keep those wet or moist in the moist sand. That's why oftentimes you might see crabs dug down in the sand if they're left on the beaches. They're looking to keep those gills 
um, exposed to some level of, of moisture um, in their environment. So they stay alive. That's how they need their oxygen. Yeah, book gills are really interesting because they're outside of the body, um, mm -hmm. you know, instead of like most, most crab that you see. So um, it, is, it is very different. Um, Okay, great. So the next question is, uh, does the wetlands Institute work with the American littoral society, uh, during a Barnaby Bay partnership shellfish restoration program, uh, coastal stewardship course, they discuss the Facebook live events coming up on 6. Uh, June 11th, this Thursday, and then June 20th, uh, their horseshoe tagging programs. I'm not sure if those uh, events are through the wetlands or American littoral society. Um, but there are going to be Facebook live events. Um, so, do you know anything about that, Lisa? Yeah, we don't. Um, so we there. Uh, um, ALS does a lot of great work on the Delaware Bay, um, and so we coordinate with them um, and around them for projects. They aren't directly involved in this, but they do a lot of restoration work, um, and so we are able to monitor the crabs and and look at how they respond um, on the um, before and after restoration work. Um, our volunteers also um, do a lot of tagging recites, so that helps ALS. Um, they they host a lot of tag. They do the tagging and run a tagging program for horseshoe crabs. So there are complementary programs in that way. So great. Um, next one. What happens if the horseshoe crab comes up to the Delaware beaches later? I guess I mean later on in the season. Do the, these dates get moved and updated? Yeah, so um, it's really um, May and, and June are really, it, it, it is kind of hardcore programmed into these crabs and it, it's a facet of water temperatures and other environmental cues or triggers that starts the spawning process. So May and June are really the times to do it or when the, the greatest number of crabs spawn. Now, the crabs will spawn not just in the greatest times; they spawn other times as well. And so there, you can find spawning horseshoe crabs um, in other times and in other locations. Um, they're just not going to be in these really kind of prime time numbers um, that you see in the Delaware Bay during May and June. So we run our program through July 15th, and it really, um, I'll show some data in a little bit. It really gets that tail end of when spawning starts to slow down. Um, but when heat and other factors are very, um, can be lethal for any crabs that are left on the beach, even for a short period of time. So we try to capture that, the, the real um, important times for crabs. Okay, and then we have two more questions and I'll let you uh, continue. Um, to one's private question, do you, do any of the tagged individuals end up in Ocean County? Oh, very, quite possible. The crabs, the crabs do move around quite a bit. Um, and um, so it is very possible and we often get tags from other states even. So um, yeah. the, the crabs can move. And then finally, uh, what is the mortality of horseshoe crabs that are bled in the pharmaceutical industry? Yeah, and that's a real good question. Um, and it's, it's not a very well-known question, I think. It's estimated to be about 25 to 30% of crabs that are bled, um, that, that's the mortality rate that's associated with the bleeding activity. So, um, but it really depends on specifics, how those crops are handled, if they're transported, how long they're held, things like that. And so, you know, I know there's efforts to try to minimize that, um, but there is a mortality rate that's associated with the bleeding and even some disruption of their behaviors um, as well. So um, that's the best estimate. All right, um, some other questions are coming through, but I'm going to let you um, continue and we'll get to the rest uh, at the end. Okay, sounds good. Great. All right, so I'm just going into a little bit more about the program now and how we function, and then I'll talk some more about data. Um, we do have um, our volunteers collect data, so um, it really helps to kind of bring everything together for us. Um, it, we keep it as simple as possible, but, but also try to make that data do work. So we, we look at it every year, we summarize it every year, we get it out to our volunteers and get it out to people who are interested in horseshoe crabs so we can try to make it help for, uh, help for design or, or point to areas of, of restoration need or, or different measures that are needed for horseshoe crabs. So um, 
the, this is just a little clip of what our data sheets look like, but we basically collect some information about the beaches themselves, you know, where and when the, the walk was occurring, how many people are there, and what the environmental conditions were. And then we have people basically just tally the number of crabs, and we do it separately for male crabs and for female crabs. So part of the training is to learn how to identify a male crab from a female crab. Um, Importantly, we want to look at these like hazards, these areas where crabs are getting trapped time and time again, so we can zero in on those for restoration work. Um, so we've, we've developed over time some categories for how we think about these hazards. So whether they're um, man-made hazards like rubble that from broken from houses that were demolished, but the, the debris wasn't taken away. Um, there's things like bin block or riprap, which are part of engineered projects to help with the erosional beach issues. Um, boat ramps, marine debris, um, fishing line is something that crabs will get trapped in quite a bit. Um, and, um, and then other things. And then we also look at natural impingements. So um, vegetation above the high tide line. Maybe there's vegetation below the high tide line on some of the um, beaches with erosional issues, and then these overwash areas. So we get the information about location of the impingement type, and and then a number and a tally of how many crabs were trapped in those over time. And these are some of the pictures to go along with our training, where we. Um, give examples of what those impingement types are when you're classifying them. And this gets back to the question about ALS. We don't do uh, horseshoe crab tagging through the Return the Favor program, but we'd like to help um, the organizations and programs that are doing that, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and, and through ALS. And so um, our volunteers will collect information. They're out there every day. And so they'll collect information about any tag crabs they find, and so we can batch submit that. And we get hundreds of crabs um, reported this way. This is our website if you're interested in going to check it out. <coughs> Excuse me. It's returnthefavornewjersey.org. <coughs> and we have a lot of information on the website. And, and in, in a year other than 2020, we'd have information about how you could join us on a public walk. Um, this year, we're not doing that. Um, we're not able to do that. Um, we have a way to submit data through our website, way to share photos and stories. And then we have lots of information in our Get Involved um, drop down menu that provides um, our reports from previous years, fact sheets, just general information about the bay that you would need as a volunteer or someone interested in horseshoe crabs. So that's what the face of our uh, website looks like. So here's some information about just last year, 20, 2019. Um, through the program, all of our partners, all of our volunteers, we collectively rescued 143,874 uh, 143, crabs. Um, we had 98 volunteers who were in charge of what we call walk leaders, but basically they're the ones who are responsible for making sure walks are scheduled, collecting data, and submitting data to us. Um, and with those walk leaders and the people that they joined, um, their friends, family, whoever that they kind of uh, went on those walks with, um, there was over uh, 27,000, uh, 2,700 uh, volunteer hours um, last year, and 700 walks were conducted. So it was a very busy year for us. We did all that work on 18 beaches. Um, and um, we do this little pie, graph, uh, pie chart down here. I'm showing how many um, crabs were rescued from each beach. Fortescue and Ravens Beach alone had 22,000 um, horseshoe crabs rescued on it. Um, and, um, and then I have a little pie graph here just showing the different, um, different categories for how those crabs were found. Uh, just under three quarters were, um, were overturned, so they were simply upside down, and so our volunteers went and turn them right side up so they could get those um, gills back in the water. They could live another day, spawn another time, and be an active part of that um, population. And that's, that's what the goal is. Um, our volunteers also rescue nearly 30,000 crabs from those man-made impingements, so rubble and riprap and, and uh, house um, bulkheads and things like that. Um, 13,000. Um, over 13,000 were in natural impingements, so grasses and marshes, 
and just under 2,000 were in overwash areas. So that's how the data broke down for last year, and it's pretty representative of what we see from, from year to year. Um, this table, our graph is gonna show um, the dates where our program ran last year from the very end of May um, up through July 15th. And what you're gonna see are um, in the orange uh, shaded areas, the filled areas of orange are the number of crabs that were rescued on each date. And then the individual blue bars that are overlaid on top of that are the number of walks that were conducted. So you can see how there were some times where we had a lot of walks and not as many crabs rescued. And then there were other times where there was a whole lot of crabs and not as, or not as many walks or a lot of crabs per walk. And so that really shows when and where um, the, our, we need the most volunteers out and how busy those walks are for the volunteers who are able to get out. And um, what we see is um, this corresponds with the moon cycles. So in dark shaded circles at the very top are the new moons and open circles show the full moons. And you can see that both that the crab activity just as slightly follows or is around um, when the new, new and moon full moon cycles are. And so we try to get volunteers out around those times. Um, since this program began in 2013, um, we have um, a cumulative uh, over half a million horseshoe crabs rescued through the program. So that was a, a milestone that we hit last year. Um, three, over 3,000 walks, 11,000 volunteer hours, and really um, bringing together a lot of great people who are so enthusiastic and, and committed to helping horseshoe crabs. But not only that, have grown friendships and a love of the birds and the beaches and helping the whole, you know, conservation of the, of the Delaware Bay ecosystem. So it's really been such a fantastic uh, program with so many good results and outcomes. Um, um, slide is just gonna show um, how we look at those and we can look from year to year of those seven years um, between um, the number of overturned, impinged, man-made impinged and naturally impinged crabs. So last year, it's, it's hard to see, for, it's showing in white on this graph, but this is 2019, 2018, 17 and going back. And you can see we've, the program has grown from year to year, um, but last year was a pretty high, um, high year for all categories across the board. It was a very busy spawning year. Um, and then here I wanna show just how those impingements break down. Um, we look at this every year. It's real important to us to understand the habitat that's available for these crabs and really trying to do what we can do to make better habitat for the crabs because they're such an important part of the ecosystem of the Delaware Bay and the species that depend on them like the Arctic uh, migratory shorebirds. And so what we've learned is that these bin blocks um, and riprap, so those engineered um, concrete areas as well as the rubble really constitute um, over 50% of the crabs that are impinged. Um, those tend to be um, real problematic areas and we see them across the board. So there aren't just one or two beaches that have these problems. It's something that's very widespread across the Delaware Bay on spawning beaches for crabs. Um, below is a, is a map showing just those bin blocks, riprap, and rubble. And there's little bubbles for each of the beaches where we count the crabs showing, um, and, the, and the bubbles are, um, are um, scaled for the number of crabs that are rescued per walk on, on those beaches. And so we can see some that are, that are bigger problem areas like Fortescue Beach. Um, so we tend to have a little bit more of an issue with um, rubble and riprap up on the Cumberland County beaches, but there are some areas on Cape May County where, the, where it is a problem as well. And then what we've done over the years is kind of, as a volunteer program, um, we key in on some of those areas and we, we try to focus through return the favor on some small scale impingement problems and then do what we can with the help of volunteers. Um, some years we've been successful in getting a little bit of funding. Um, and so a lot of these pro projects we've been able to, to do um, with volunteer effort and some funding um, to um, try to fix those impingement areas or at least make them so they're not gonna be trapping as many crabs. 
what that does is it prevents the crabs from getting trapped, but it also frees up our volunteers to go help crabs in other areas. So they're not just tending certain areas time and time again. Um, we did a small project in 2014. This was our very first one um, at East Point Lighthouse and, and the um, boat ramp at the time had some gaps that trap crabs on every tide. And so we were able to just fill that with some available debris material and concrete and um, and make it so the trap the crabs didn't get trapped or fewer of them did and the volunteers could um, put their efforts in elsewhere so that was our first project and we we did see a reduction in the number of crabs that were trapped on that beach um, in two years um, we were able to do a rubble removal project at moore's beach um, we removed over thirty two thousand pounds of debris by hand um, we had high school students help us um, we had volunteers out to help us and um, try to uh, make this beach so there was a better spawning habitat available for horseshoe crabs. And um, work at Fortescue, patching up bulkheads where crabs would get trapped behind derelict bulkheads. That's been another point of interest and we're trying to do a little bit more of that work um, hopefully this year. And um, that's going to be through the US partner, uh, US Fish and Wildlife Service Partners Program for Fish and Wildlife. Um, we did some rubble removal through that program already, and we'll be um, hopefully helping um, to um, improve the condition of some of the bulkheads so we can, again, um, remove stranding hazards for crabs. So basically, this program, we're trying to integrate the work that we're doing, this you know, every crab that we rescue is, feels great, but then we're also collectively using the data that comes from the program to look for better ways we can all pitch in and pull together to protect the Delaware Bay and make for stronger communities and beaches in better condition and hopefully recover these populations of horseshoe crabs and shorebirds and, and other taxa. Um, and, um, you know, I think something that's really grown from this program is a great network of invested volunteers and and um, we we um, have a great time working together and um, I'd really um, offer for everyone to anyone who's interested to reach out to me. I can get you more information um, this year. We were able to run the program, um, but we had to just rely on people who have been involved with it in previous years because it's just an unusual year for everyone this year. Um, so it's it's we it were a little bit reduced in our capacity, um, but we have you know our dedicated volunteers who have experience and kind of know what they're doing, who are out on the beaches helping. Um, we typically start in late April. We ended up starting in mid May, um, and um, but everyone's been out and doing um, you know doing what they do, and um, so far um, having a great season. Um, it's been very busy. Um, and um, next year, I'm, I'm collecting a list of people who want to get involved for next year. Um, so we'll be able to have the resources to, you know, accommodate, train, and support new volunteers. If you're interested in getting involved for next year, um, you can reach out to me, and um, and we'll be in contact as we we set training dates and and that that sort of thing. Um, but we're we're definitely. Um, you know, really grateful to be able to do what we're able to do this summer, um, even though it's it's less of um, of a program that it often is. Um, we also do walks for the public. So if you're not interested in taking on um, the responsibility of the data collection and data submission and figuring out the schedule or going out at 4 a.m., we'll set times for you to join someone who will take those responsibilities on. And so you can get to participate, get your hands on, get out to help, but but not have to do those other steps. So. <clears throat> Again, that's not something we're able to do this year, but we will. That's a typical part of our program, and we'll we'll be able to um, look forward to doing that again next year. And um, <coughs> excuse me, I have up here our website, returnthefavornewjersey.org. Again, you can check that out to find more information. There's also um, a way you can get in touch um, through that. There's a through our email contact us through that website if you want to be put on our volunteer list for 2021. And um, and there's also lots of volunteer opportunities through our partner organizations on the Delaware Bay or through the conservation work that they do. Um, and so they're listed here. 
And I think that is all I have, Caitlin, um, in terms of the presentation, but I'm happy to take more questions if there are any. I'm sorry, I'm often at the moment. That's okay. I, I, have, <laughs> I have that too. I have allergies this time of the year. So um, thank you so much. That was great. You guys do a lot of really good work trying to save those guys on the beaches. Yeah. Um, so I, I'd like everybody to give uh, Lisa a virtual applause. There's actually a little megaphone right above the chat feature and you can click the applause, it'll pop up. So it's kind of kind of cool. Um, so great job. Uh, we do have more questions. Um, I'll try to get to everybody's um, in time. So we have uh, first is a private, I'm just gonna do them in the order that they came in for me. Um, so, can you provide more details uh, or numbers about the population decline over the years on horseshoe crabs? I think. Uh, yeah, it's, there, it depends on. Um, there's different sources for that in different surveys, um, <clears throat> depending on spawning surveys. If you look at that, um, or trawl surveys. Um, so, there's varied information. Some of it will. Um, some surveys will point to the fact that there is. It's about ninety percent of what it what it once was, the, the horseshoe crab population. Um, but the numbers are lower um, in the Delaware Bay. And so the Delaware Bay, there's also spawning surveys and important spawning beaches on the Delaware side. Of it. It's not just New Jersey, um, also the Delaware Bay. I'm, I'm sorry, the state of Delaware side of um, the bay. And so there are coordinated <laughs> spawning surveys that'll look at, um, at um, the overall um, spawning population and how that changes. And it does seem that there's been a shift the last several years to more crab spawning in New Jersey as well. And so it's not just where the crabs are spawning or what that whole population is. Um, so it's a, it's a larger snap, snapshot view um, for looking at the, the population. Um, so there isn't, um, so the population has, has declined um, or seems to have declined pretty significantly. And then it's just seems to be stabilizing though. Um, at, at low levels, um, but has, um, I don't think there's an indication yet that it's turned and is, is recovering. Gotcha. Okay. Um, next, uh, a great question here. Um, may have touched on a little bit, but if you, sh if someone, uh, not registered with the program sees stranded horseshoe crab, um, on a beach that they are allowed to walk on. Um, so I guess if you're on the beach going, you know, out for the day and you see a strand of horseshoe crab, what do you do? Yeah, so um, it, it's a bit of a slightly tricky question because I think everyone's instinct is to want to help an animal that they see that they can help and easily help and not cause harm, which would be a simple act of turning a crab over. Um, part of the reason we have to have the structure that we do for return of the favor is because of the horseshoe crab moratorium. Um, where you can't take crabs. Um, and so we need to be sure our volunteers um, are, it doesn't, um, but they're not, they're not taking crabs, they're handling crabs to rescue crabs, they're not taking them, removing them from beaches or removing them from the population. Um, so our volunteers have to be registered and signed up. Um, and um, I think, and, that's that's the reason why, so that people aren't handling crabs um, without the permission to do it. Um, I think that it would be hard to tell someone not to help crabs if they see crabs that are that need to be helped, though. If it's an open beach, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, someone uh, Lori shared. It looks like a horseshoe crab molt, and you can see from the molt the book gills and oh, they yeah, nice. Yeah, they look a little different uh, in the molt than they do in the uh, horseshoe crab, but I, I'm going to share it with everybody in that link there. Yeah, that would be great. Um, so the next question is um, about crab anatomy again. Um, do you have to worry about them latching onto you, biting, crawling when you overturn them uh, and re remove them uh, if they're in, in an impingement? Um, and then also, why are they turning? Why are they getting stuck? Is there something wrong with them physically, environmentally? What causes this? Um, are they just really heavy and can't turn? Um, so it's kind of a two-parter question. Yeah, and and it's a great question there. And there's a lot of there's a lot of reasons. I think um, it's some in the literature. It's been estimated that there was a study that about 10% of the population is just naturally lost to um, being stranding uh, to stranding every year. 
Um, and so, um, and that's for a whole suite of reasons. Um, sometimes they just um, don't have, because of their anatomy, they have that tail that helps to flip them over if they can get in the right position. But if the sand isn't very hard packed, it digs in more than it acts as a pry to, to flip themselves over. Um, sometimes that tail is broken off and so they no longer have that tool or it's reduced in its size. Um, sometimes the beach is, the slope of the beach is not right, it's too steep. And so again, they can't quite get in the position in order to lever themselves over. So there's some geomorphology issues with the beaches um, that can change. Um, and it have changed over time um, on the Delaware Bay that makes them probably uh, the horseshoe crabs less adapted to being able to right themselves. Um, also rougher waters, we don't have as many oyster, oyster reefs or natural barriers to reduce that wave energy that's hitting the beaches. And so it might be that the waters are rougher and the more crabs are overturned. Um, in terms of the, um, impingement factors, we're losing a lot of the beaches. Um, there, there have been many restoration projects, especially since Hurricane Sandy, that have been trying to add sand, um, add back um, some of the wave breaks um, just offshore and the near shore waters to help dissipate that wave energy and allow those beaches to build and stop receding. Um, in the process of doing that, there's been, in some areas like whole communities, streets, roads, houses that have been taken down or um, basically um, become one with the bay. And so that's left rubble of homes that have been dismantled um, or left behind. And so that's where a lot of the rubble is coming or there has been structures put in place to try to prevent that erosion from and houses and communities from succumbing to that erosion. So all those things are kind of at, at play here and making for um, worse conditions for the horseshoe crabs that are coming up to spawn. Okay. Um, next question, uh, kind of related is where all the, where is all the rubble coming from on Moore's beach? Yeah. So in Moore's beach, um, a lot of that was from homes, um, and roads that were there that, um, just, um, were destroyed. And then it could be been covered in sand and then that's been exposed or um, it just was never removed in the first place when those homes were taken down. There was just a lot of rubble left behind. There was just some homes on Money Island that were taken down last year and we have the same problem. Um, a lot of rubble was left behind. It wasn't a clean slate after the homes were removed um, through the Blue Acres program. And so um, there's more hazards for the crabs that are there right now. So we can, and we see that in the data through our program and we get that feedback from our volunteers. So then we can try to point and direct, you know, attention to those beaches. Some of it's much larger scale than we can handle as through our program, but then there are ways that we can point and direct our volunteers and, and develop um, smaller scale rubble removal projects to try to improve things. Uh, final question for today, uh, do horseshoe crabs get caught on living reefs on the Delaware Bay beaches? They can, and, and many of the people who are, are doing those, um, um, doing those um, uh, projects are, are monitoring for um, horseshoe crabs and whether they're getting stuck and trying to understand that themselves. And then so that can go into and be factored into the design of how they're built and, and how they're maintained over time. So it's definitely um, part of it. Um, and we have some of the partners that are involved in the program have been um, using Return the Favor as a way to help monitor um, in the crabs getting stuck in, in, in their project areas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I understand uh, Rutgers Haskin Shellfish Lab um, also monitors those horseshoe crabs near their oyster reefs and yeah. has been tracking them and making sure that it doesn't affect them and where they lay their eggs and all that. So exactly. Awesome. Yep. Okay. Um, I think that is it. Um, if you have any other questions or want to follow up, I'll put my uh, email in the chat box here. And I can't talk and type at the same time. <laughs> uh, oops, I think I just sent it privately by accident. So hold on, let me redo this. Um, there we go. Um, so thank you again, Lisa, for 
taking time out of your day to to chat um, and being so flexible with um, you know moving our originally scheduled April lunch and learn to to now June and going virtual. We really appreciate it. Um, so uh, keep up all the great work with return the favor um, and we'll chat with you soon. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Yep. Thanks everyone. Thanks everybody. Thanks Lisa and Joe and uh, talk to you guys soon. Bye bye. Bye bye.